Okay, ladies and gentlemen of physical science, this is Mr. Call here. In case you missed our conversation about covalent bonding on Friday, October 30th, day before Halloween, here's a uh, quick explanation of the slides that you have available to you on the daily deal through Canvas. So covalent bonding was something that we started to dive into this week, okay? Here's a quick problem that is related to covalent bonding, trust me. Uh, and just follow along. So Doug goes to a Best Buy. He's looking to purchase a pair of Beats Studio 3 wireless headphones. They've got a price tag of 300 bucks. The problem is Doug doesn't have 300 bucks. Doug has 275 and Best Buy is not in the uh, habit of just giving their Beats away for at a discounted price. Marshall comes to Best Buy. He's going to buy the same pair of Beats and he has 300 bucks. He could walk up and buy them all by himself for $300, no issues. He doesn't have to do anything with Doug if he doesn't want to. But Best Buy happens to have a special deal going on, which includes getting two pairs of the Beats Studio 3 wireless headphones for a very reasonable price of $500. Two sets for $500, right? What would you, do, what would you suggest these two people do? Well, if Doug's on his own, he's out of there. He's not getting any Beats. If Marshall's on his own, he can get them. He can pay the 300 bucks. Let's assume that price includes tax. He can have his headphones and he can go home and be just fine. Some of you might already be putting together this idea that if Doug and Marshall get together and pool their money, right, the two sets of headphones at $500 means that each of them would cost $250. Meaning that Doug could get his headphones for $250 and walk away with $25 left from his $275. And Marshall could get the Beats um, for, for $250 and walk away with $50 of his $300 if they share their money. Okay, now keep that in mind. If they rely on each other, then they walk away with a better price, something more advantageous, and they're both happy. This is how covalent bonding works. Here's an example. This is hydrogen and oxygen that is used to form H2O. There's a bell. Hydrogen has one valence electron. It needs two for its first energy level to be completely full, okay? Oxygen, on the other hand, look at the outer energy level here, has one, two, three, four, five, six. It has six valence electrons, and it's looking for eight for that outer energy level to be completely full. Both will be happy if they can have their outer energy level completely full. Hydrogen just needs one more, because there's only room for two out here, and oxygen needs two more, for it, for it to have its octet or eight out there, right? So why does hydrogen bond with oxygen? Why does it take two hydro hydrogens to bond? Because like the Beats by Dre for Doug and Marshall, they share their electrons rather than trading them like happens with an ionic bond. Hydrogen holds on to its one electron. It doesn't get rid of it. But when it gets close to oxygen, it gets to share those two. It's almost like it's pretending those two belong to it even though it only brought one to the table. And this hydrogen is doing the same down here. It's sharing one of oxygens, and it's brought one valence electron on its own, which makes it feel happy because it has access to two. Now count the electrons that oxygen has available to it if they share. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. Oxygen has access to eight, so it becomes stable and happy, like a noble gas because they are all sharing their electrons, okay? As soon as one of those atoms leaves and takes its electrons with it, nobody's happy anymore. It doesn't work. So they covalently bond together because they get something out of sharing their electrons together. And that's the idea behind covalent bonding. Look at two fluorine atoms. Two fluorine atoms, each one has seven valence electrons. One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Fluorine wants eight. It doesn't want to give any up. It needs to have one. So another fluorine atom actually doesn't want to get rid of any of its valence electrons either. But look what happens if they just get close. Two fluorine atoms, like twin brothers, right? They get close to each other and share, and this fluorine, fluorine on the left looks like it has access to eight valence electrons. And the one on the right, because they're sharing, looks like it has access to eight valence electrons. They're both happy as long as they keep close to each other, and that's a covalent bond. This one on the bottom is just hydrogen and oxygen again in a slightly different way, but showing the same covalent bond, right? So what I'd like you to do on the back of your naming booklet, if you came to class this week, you have a naming booklet. 
I want you to write on the very back, okay? Not the side that opens up, but the side that has your name. Go ahead and write these four types of bonds on the back. And when you write covalent, I want you to make the note that electrons are shared. And when you write ionic bond, I want you to write there that electrons are traded. The two other types are soon to come. Metallic bonding and hydrogen bonding we'll talk about on another day. But when you think of covalent bonding, I want you to think of this idea of sharing. And when you think of ionic, I want you to think of this idea of trading. Okay? Have a wonderful day.